When Tom Rob Smith published his debut novel, Child 44, it became an international bestseller, translated into over 30 languages and selling over 2 million copies. Two more novels followed to complete a trilogy, but anyone thinking that he might rest on his laurels as a thriller writer may be in for a surprise with his latest. Cold People sees the human race presented with an ultimatum by an invading alien force. With 30 days to reach Antarctica, the only part of the world where they are now permitted to live, the journey is just the first hardship of many, in a story which sees humans forced to adapt in ways that may change our species forever. I sat down with Tom to talk about speculative fiction, human tenacity, and what the future might really hold. I'm not one for reducing books um, too much, Tom, but... Uh, I love a book that has a good elevator pitch and Cold People has a fantastic uh, elevator pitch. I'm not going to be the one to do it. I wonder whether you would like to briefly explain the kind of setup for Cold People. Oh, really? I was like, yeah, give it to me. I want to hear, I want to hear, I want to hear the great pitch. I find pitching really hard. I think that there's a real, there's a real skill to it. But, you know, to telescope it down, and I agree, there's always, there's always a danger to this. But um, was I really wanted to take... Um, the idea of collecting up all of the world's population and putting them in the most inhospitable place on earth and seeing how we as a group of people would survive in that extraordinary situation. And that place is Antarctica. And Antarctica is interesting because it's been almost like science fiction for so long. Mm. Like you go back 300 years, go back 500 years, there's kind of mythology about it, this place. So it's sort of interesting to set a story which is speculative fiction in a continent that's kind of full of mystery. And so once you get down there, there's, you know, the nuts and bolts of surviving, which is about obviously the cold and the psychological pressure. But the simple truth is the bases that are there now are completely supported by um, imports. There's no self, it couldn't be self-sufficient. So how do you become self-sufficient on the most inhospitable continent? on earth and they realize actually it's impossible and we have to adapt genetically and so that's in a sense the premise like this idea of how do you survive there and and um and the 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 results that follow from the attempt to survive i'm of course intrigued to know what the spark was for writing this book because obviously it's quite a departure from your previous novels which have tended to be sort of historical thrillers and have that kind of as you say this sort of speculative fiction and this sort of as i say killer idea at the beginning what 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 was the sort of original spark there or, is it, or was it just this idea of what happens if you if you plonk the human race in in the most inhospitable place on earth well you know i mean there are a couple of ways of splitting that question the first is i've always you know there are lots of you know real life templates for this even though it seems like a very elevated or you know speculative idea you know people have been forcefully moved from their homes across you know many countries across many generations and often they're given the worst land that you know they take their, their the best land is taken from they're given the worst land and they have to survive and they're dealing with whether it's flu you know you know so that you know there are many examples of that and the problem with trying to write about those now is um you know there are great history books on those and so they become you know they're quite hard to kind of delve into so I was wondering how do you take that story that we've associated quite strongly with particular groups and make it about all of us um so I remember thinking about that but um I also think you know in terms of my writing career that I've never really had any kind of strategy or plan I, everything's <laughs> a bit of an accident I mean I've been thinking about it a lot recently because they do look very disparate and I think you know but I when I came back for I was I was making uh Cambodia's first soap opera and when I was at 24 25 and I came back from that and I just met you know when you're trying to make it as a writer you kind of you, you have your mind open and I remember they this production company said we want to adapt this uh, short story and it was about serial killers and so I started doing research into serial killers and that's how I stumbled across the Chikatilo case in mm. um which is interesting now in in the way um you know, the way that Russia has just invaded Ukraine, because obviously that story had a lot to do with Ukraine and, and Stalin's famine and the way in which actually Stalin used famine and Putin's using energy is very similar. Mm. But it, I stumbled across it. It was like this, I thought this story was really interesting. And then I, 
adapted it. And then I realized afterwards that the history that followed that period was really interesting. So I wrote the trilogy, but then the farm was based on something that happened to, in my personal life, um, in the sense that happened to my family. So that source for that was re the real world. Uh, London Spy was, I, you know, that case, you know, just jumped out at me as something that would be really interesting to fictionalize the Gareth Williams case. Mm. So you know, I don't have any kind of plan. And with this, I was deep in lockdown thinking, I, you know, why have I never written the book? that I would have loved to have read as a kid. Like I love science fiction. I love those big, you know, kind of that sense of, you know, being teleported to another world and really thinking about big ideas, but it's still being kind of um, taught and pacey. And, and, you know, I have a nephew and I've never written a book that he could really read. And I thought I want to write a book that everyone could read. It wasn't, you know, so I was, you know, there were lots of different things. I mean, in circulation, but even but the new, it happens at the new TV show I'm working on for, Hulu, which goes out on Disney Plus in the UK, um, has science fiction elements too. So um, I've now been for the last sort of five years doing two speculative fiction ideas. Mm. What's the name of the TV series? Please feel free to give it a nice plug. Oh, it's called uh, Class of 09. It doesn't need any plugging, really. It's like, like <laughs> open class. You know, like it's like books, really. You have to work hard with TV shows. I'm like, oh, they just put up a poster of the cast. It's got really <laughs> Hey, um, um, uh, it's a Brian Terry Henry from Atlanta. He's incredible. Um, it's, yeah, it's got a great cut. Anyway, it's about the FBI, and it's like it's following this class of tra trainees. Um, so that that is, and in three timelines, uh, past, present, and future. Okay, we should look forward to that. Getting getting back to cold people, this sort of it's almost like world building. It seems to me when you're creating um, that environment in Antarctica and with so many people in there, and I wonder how you go about that did you have to do some practical research or were you it was this very much you know as you said whilst you were stuck in lockdown uh presumably stuck in your apartment yeah you're right i mean i had booked actually a trip down there i mean it's not that sounds super it is an adventure but it's nothing particularly daring i think you get the boat from the tip of south america and you cross drake's passage and then which is pretty stormy but then i think you just follow the peninsula down for a week mm. so i booked that I was very excited about it. And then the pandemic happened. And um, so that physically became impossible. And in fact, I think there was like some, I think there was a boat, an Antarctica trip that got isolated for ages because of COVID cases and no port would accept. I remember thinking that anyway. So it's kind of interesting, like the the world became as crazy as, mm. as you know, whenever people talk about plausibility, I'm always like, you know, things are implausible until they happen. And then, you know, <laughs> then they seem very plausible. And then, you know, so the world really became crazy in that. And um, yeah, so I was in the depths of lockdown and um, I didn't go physically. It was all just, it was based upon, um, you know, research, which is actually the first time I've done that because with Russia, I'd been at, you know, I hadn't been to everywhere in the, in the books, but I've been to lots of the places. Um, but still, it would have been impossible to write that book because it was a story of Child 44, I mean, without the without all the research. And with this, there were some really wonderful books, actually. I mean, it's interesting on Antarctica because sort of with Soviet Russia, the range is enormous. But with Antarctica, there's, you know, there are books about people that walk across it. Mm. And there are books about people who work in those bases. And there are histories of it. But it's quite a recent discovery. And actually, the range is quite like, you know, whenever I you know research, but you go into a really good bookshop and you just kind of, look at the entire collection of books and pick some out. And it was interesting on Antarctica how it felt narrower than some of the other topics. Mm. There were the really kind of detailed scientific studies about climate and ice. Um, and then there's living in those stations, which were more in, in some ways as important as the, the science elements. And the history was interesting, but it wasn't as daunting a research project as Russia, where there was just, you know, shelves and shelves and shelves of books <laughs> um obviously as i said the the sort of the, the concept behind the book and i don't want to give away too much of the plot but as you say it sort of i mean the human population have to work on ways of, of adapting the human genome to to survive in that environment but this is a very human story and what you do is you focus very much on a, a group of characters and i suppose the, the beating heart maybe of that would be atto um and is it lisa or liza I say Liza, but Liza. you know. Um, tell me a little about a bit about creating them because they meet 
literally on the day that the world is turned upside down. But there, there is something incredibly strong about their relationship. Well, I always, you know, what is, what is the fun of kind of the, the heart of being able to do something really interesting with this premise is, you know, if you're going to upend the world, I really was interested in this idea of two people meeting and having this really strong sense that they were perfect for each other, but everything about their life was meant that they were never going to get together. Like, you know, he was living in Lisbon, she's living in the States, she's on a holiday. It just felt like there was, you know, they could kind of feel in their hearts that this was something really special. But in their heads, they were like, well, I'm going to go back to the States and mm. you're here. It's never going to be anything more than a holiday fling. And then suddenly the only way this perfect relationship or what they believed could be a perfect relationship could happen is the world is upended. And they're suddenly like they're grouped together in a way that is breaks down all those other previous um, distinctions. And that, in a sense, was one of the idea. Once you have this mass migration, all of those previous lines between us break apart. Mm. And so everyone is together in a, in a very different way. Um, and I found that very interesting emotionally. Um, so yeah, that relationship is, and then, you know, that that sense of what it is to be loved, you carry down into this this world and how you have to hold on to that is sort of at the heart of the whole story. Like, you know, what is surviving if not you know, what is the thing that you hold on to? Is surviving at any cost? What is that? You know, how much do you have to change of yourself in order to survive? They're kind of the central themes of that, mm. of, 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 of the, the dilemmas of when they get down there. And, you know, is it a form of extinction? There's obviously the extinction where everyone would then, you know, the, the human race would come to an end. But is it a form of extinction when the, the thing that replaces you is so different that it's another form of extinction in a way? Mm. And that's what they're kind of grappling with. Mm. Well, I, one of the things I really loved um, about the book is that the the crisis, if you like, is a great leveller so that people's previous status is completely irrelevant when they get down to Antarctica. It doesn't matter if you're the leader of a gigantic nation. If you have no practical skills, you have no place really in the community. Is I mean, that's quite a political statement. Um, and I can see you sort of with a little smile at the corner of your mouth there. So I wonder whether, you know, is it is is it was that an important part of writing this story to sort of put people in their place if you like well i think it's just i found you know everyone talks about this i mean and it's been used as well dystopian in some ways i find the society really interesting mm. and i find the, the, the fictional society that's on antarctica sounds you know very tough but actually there's lots of things about it in terms of diet in terms of the way things are shared in terms of the way of looking at you have to re you know the economy is completely separate it's not about money it's about practicality and and I think all of these questions are in circulation now. I think we're in a real, you know, situation where I don't think lots of the decisions we make make much sense. But I think one of the things that's interesting about, you know, speculative fiction or science fiction or genre is that you're able to get into these questions without feeling like you're critiquing a government or critiquing a group of people. Mm. You don't get into that kind of quagmire. It doesn't feel as it doesn't feel like you're kind of getting into a partisan squabble. You can just think about it and people can react to different elements and that's what I think is great about fiction in a way. I think, you know, it's very, you know, we live in such a polarized, divisive um, form of communication in society now. And I kind of wanted this story to be about things without it being, um, you know, aggravating in that sense. Mm -hmm. and, you know, one of the other big things is about adaptation itself. I think, you know, we know that we're going to miss 1.5. We know there's going to be huge changes. I mean, I've read, you know, I've read you know, who knows what's going to happen, but you've, they're talking about, you know, one eighth of the world's population will have to start moving from different parts of the world because they're uninhabitable. And I'm like, well, that's not that different from this premise where you're seeking out new lands and what that will mean, you know? So I think that, you know, what feels very speculative and elevated here seems to me like it's talking about things that are coming. Well, I'm so glad you said that because I thought, am I, would I be reaching to ask you about, uh, our current climate crisis and and is in fact this book um not so much an outlandish idea but simply a, a truncated timeline of what we're actually going through it is simply that we are forced immediately to to deal with a, a terrible situation whereas what we're doing at the moment is trying desperately to ignore the one that we're more slowly approaching perhaps it's obviously something you think about i did think about it a lot and i think you know the thing about the climate it's all become about what do we have to give up? It becomes, you know, like, do we drive less? Do we fly less? Do we, you know, not eat meat? And these questions are vital right now. But I, in a sense, again, they become very polarized and they become very 
partisan and what I wanted to do was jump over all of that and just say, okay, well, let's just look at the idea of, you know, this catastrophe has happened in some form. How do we adapt? And in some ways that question then is open to everyone because it doesn't feel like you're getting embroiled in anything. You're just thinking, well, you know, we're gonna, if, we're, if we're not going to make the changes now, what are we going to do with this, this, with our ingenuity, with our brilliance, you know, as a species and as a group of people to try and survive. And that became quite optimistic in some ways. I think the book has quite a lot of, you know, I think it celebrates lots of our science and our ability and our tenacity and what we live for. So, you know, I found it quite like uh, when I was writing it, quite a hopeful group of, I, I certainly like spending time down there. It didn't feel, you know, sometimes I would finish work on the on a chapter or something and turn on the news and I felt more <laughs> hopeful than the thing I was writing. I re- and, you know, it sounds facetious or glib, but I would look at that and think, I don't, I don't know. I love the idea on the, and the equal thing of getting down there and being like, okay, now things are so bad, we have to make decisions based upon you know, necessity and not about, you know, popularist ideas or whatever. And that felt yeah. like really, I was like, that's, that sounds quite good. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose is I suppose the, the the enemy, if you like, or the, the problem is also complacency. Um the of course life feels very comfortable and uncomplicated uh, until you're pushed into a corner. And in this book obviously the whole human race is forced to reevaluate all sorts of things but it's our complacency i suppose again in the face of the tr- the problems that we can see coming down the line that that's causing the problem in terms of progress yeah i mean i mean i i don't know what what it is i mean like, you know you can listen to philosophers and and economists talking about why it is we struggle to deal with the future rather than the present like the present is weighted significantly apart compared to decisions we're making in the future and and apparently that's just the way we're programmed. Um, so, you know, um, and yeah, is it, is it, I mean, maybe, you know, there's a sense that we're just not good at forestalling crisis, but we're quite good at grappling with them when they happen. And that's, you know, so I skip over the, the inability to deal, you know, to stop it from happening and, and just go straight into the grappling with it. And, um, but I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, because it's a, because the premise isn't that, because the premise is that we're just forced to in a way that, you know, other people have been forced to move, you know, it kind of takes out that whole chunk of debate and you don't have to get into the minutiae or the, you know, the, as you say, that the timeline changes. So it's not this kind of incremental change. It's like mm. a sudden jolt and that enables you to both telescope the time scale, but also get away from the granular details of things breaking apart. The alien sort of invasion, if you like, that precipitates this crisis, we we never see them and we never understand necessarily the motivation or what is happening to the rest of the planet whilst the human race has moved down to Antarctica. Have you deliberately left that opaque or do you have a very clear idea about what what's going on on the rest of the planet whilst we're what, reading cold people? Well, I always thought there's no reason that if, you know, a new species turned up on Earth that they would necessarily be interested in us. Mm. I mean, that is not guaranteed. It's not, I'm not saying either way. I just thought it was interesting if they turn up and they're interested in the planet. And we seem to have made such a mess of it that they're like, listen, we have to do something. We, we you know, there's <laughs> interplanetary law, which means we can't just wipe you all out. So you've got to get down there and we're going to do the thing that we're here to do. And you're not part of it. I just think there's a sense that we're so sure that we would be, the, um, you know, we would be the the, 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 the people, the, the people that they would be interested in. I kind of found it was really interesting to take the idea and just say, well, we become irrelevant and they're interested in something else. I think what, it, you know, it, I, I was using it as a device to get everyone down there, as you say, to, to shorten the, the timeline. And again, I think this sense of, you know, because we're, I mean, you mentioned that sense of complacency, that word complacency. And I think we're so sure of our own superiority it would be interesting to think about ourselves as clearly a secondary species. And that I think helps us with the genetic st- stuff that goes on, because right now I think one of the reasons we're so reluctant to do it is we're so sure that our genetic code is somehow special. Hmm. Suddenly, if you're like, okay, well, we're just kind of like everything else where, you know, the, we, we, we tamper with all these kind of other species because we think, well, it's just, you know, a cow. And now we're like, well, there's a species that's, 
infinitely smarter than us. So, okay, there's this huge gap, let's start bridging it. And I think one of the interesting things about looking at genetic technology is, it's one of the few technologies that isn't being explored because it's, you know, redlined by ethical considerations. And I was like, what premise could we create that would mean those would disappear? Hmm. And that, I think, was behind the idea as well. When you're writing about the actual science of this uh, potential science fiction, again, do you feel did you feel that you needed to do a lot of research to make sure that it was at least possible or true or um, and not too far from reality? Yeah, the genetic engineering stuff in particular. I mean, there there's um, I tell you what, the way the distinction I make is I think that these the ideas behind the genetic engineering are really accessible and really exciting. And the same is true for Antarctica. All of these research topics have this, you know, there's a, wherever you've read them before, read anything about it or studied it at a school, like there are these really, you know, it's easy to follow the big ideas and principles mm. and they're very exciting. And then as soon as you get into the minutiae, it becomes like you need a PhD, <laughs> particularly less so on Antarctica because you, everyone kind of knows how to has a basic sense of the weather, but genetics is really extraordinarily complicated. And as soon as that happened, I was like, well, it becomes slightly dishonest for me to kind of parrot stuff that is that I personally find really bewildering. Um, so I kept to the basic, um, the basic and very exciting big ideas behind them, which all felt true. Like everything, all of the genetic research, um, I mean, I love reading it and and there was a kind of, you can feel like there's a layer of it. And as soon as you get deeper into, you know, the actual structures of genetics and how, if you change this, it becomes really tricky. And so that point I, I pulled back and you imagine that the people who are experts would do all that, but the big ideas felt true and, and, um, and supported by the research that I had done, including the fact that people are theorizing that people are doing this genetic engineering now, and they're just not talking about it. Well, that's what I was going to ask, because as you say, one of the characters basically admits that the, the country they come from has been doing it on the quiet. And thank God, because they're a bit more advanced than others. Do, do Yeah, I was going to say, do you think that that is the case and that, that it is happening, but we just don't know about it yet? I'd be very surprised if um, that wasn't the case, because I think there's a sense that everyone is looking for the advantage and that one is, you know, if, if that one is tricky, but at the same time, could you afford to give it up? It's very hard for people to give up the an, a sense that there's some area which they're just not going to explore because of ethical reasons. And I just, mm. I, 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 my instinct is it is happening. People are pushing boundaries right now. What, how do you feel about that? Because obviously, as you say, we're quite happy to tinker with the genetic code of all sorts of animals on this planet. And we, we have this moral line with ourselves. If it was in your book, obviously, it's a question of survival. It's about using characteristics from other species in order to make humans more hardy, more advanced, if you like. Would would it be an advance, do you think, uh, to do this? Or, or, or will we always still sort of um, be slightly squeamish about crossing that, that line? I'm actually not... I, I Maybe it's just as I've read so much about it and thought about it, but I actually don't find my instinct is i don't find myself becoming squeamish about it hmm. i wouldn't like if someone said we've now you know this this genetic code altering would you know stop a particular form of illness or sickness that seems to me an interesting discovery i mean and, and i and i lots of the debate i think has been refracted because it, you know some of the people that were interested in it have been the worst people in humanity whether it was the nazis or so you know i think lots of the debate is shadowed by that mm. if you take that shadow out and you look at it and think well you know you think something like the hiv crisis could be saved by a small you know could be ended by a small change in the genetic code or those things seem to me really interesting i'm not quite sure why I don't have the same squeamishness, put it that way. And mm. I don't know, just from writing the book, but I was like, you know, if we are on the brink of of making these big, big breakthroughs, why wouldn't we do it? But I think, you know, I, I, I don't know whether it's wrapped up in a sense of humility or some sense that nature, you know, why, if you're changing nature somewhere else, what is the argument not to change it for yourself? And my honest feeling is people do think that our code is, is special and why would you unravel it? And so therefore, if you realize that it wasn't that special, maybe you'd be more 
you know, happy to unravel it. Um, the book has a very satisfying ending, but it is also a slightly open ending. It suggests that there could be a sequel or there could be more story to come. Are you tempted at all to, to carry on this story or, or do you see that this is an end? Um, you know, what's really interesting is that, and I, you know, you don't really realize until you've written a few books of what you really love. And I really love world creation. I really love starting something and having to figure out um, the full dimensions in terms of research. And, and actually, to be perfectly honest, that feeling at the beginning of, you know, do I know what I'm doing? And that real sense of um, uncertainty and, and discovery. And um, so, you know, just, you know, my, I know that my next book is something completely different. I'm halfway through it now. And um, I, and, you know, the class of 09 is something completely different. And my next TV thing would be something completely different. So I, you know, I just love that sense of discovery. And I, you know, so I would be, it would, I'd have to really think about how to try and capture that lightning of new discovery and in, in mm. continuing forward. And rather than it just being, okay, let's take the stories and move forward chronologically. And so until I had that sense of, okay, there's something really exciting that I haven't done, mm. then I'd probably be reluctant to do it. I think the readers can tell they're like, oh, you've just carried on. They want that sense. <laughs> feeling you know like <laughs> i think you know and you can see it in like uh you know you can see it in movie sequels where you go in and you're like actually this is a whole new thing mm. it continues but it's got its own internal energy and those are kind of wonderful and there are others where you're like okay this is just sort of this is a sort of photocopy of the first one and i think no one really enjoys those so if i could work out the internal energy of something new and exciting then i'd do it and if anyone wanted to read it, we'll have to see. <laughs> of course. Um, I actually, I read this book at the end of last year when there was a real cold snap here. It was about minus seven, I think, outside. And it didn't matter how long the heating was on in the house, it would not warm up. So I did a form of method reading. I felt very, very cold all the time. But I would recommend. It's quite, I find it quite an immersive experience. Um, I, were you, was it like that at all when you were writing it? Or was were you writing this in the heat of summer? <sighs> I think lockdown was, there was one beautiful, the first lockdown had beautiful weather, didn't it? It did, incredible summer, yeah. Yeah, there was a really... So whilst that was happening, you were writing about Antarctica. <laughs> but the second lockdown was freezing. Yeah. So I was running during that. Um, yeah, I didn't, no, I didn't write it in, a, I, didn't, I didn't go off to a hut in Sweden, which I could have done and, and written it in the snow. I mean, I would have gone crazy. But um, <laughs> I don't know what the book would have been like. I knew because it was funny because I was reading about the Antarctica test, about the psychological test, which is, yeah. you know, it's not really actually about can you, you know, put on the, the layers and deal with the cold. It's whether you can deal with the dark and whether your brain can take, you know, six months of that kind of isolation. And the truth is no one knows until they do it. Yeah. And so I, but I'm pretty sure I would struggle. I'm pretty sure I would find, I don't know what the, my, my mind would go during that six months. But um. So um, I did imagine that a lot, and lockdown was a bit like that in terms of isolation rather than mm. cold. But um, yeah, no, I, I haven't ever gone into those insane temperatures of like minus thirty or anything. I never experienced that. It's, it's hard to comprehend, but my my house certainly felt pretty close to it at times. Anyway, Tom, thank you so much. It's been great to speak to you uh, about cold people and, and to hear a little bit more about what into it. So thank you so much. No, thank you. It's been nice talking to you.